All right, so it's 11 and we're gonna start our event. I hope you see my screen. It's the, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> it's the uh, faith, uh, Facebook page where the event and the details are announced. I am Dr. Monse Feu. I'm the Associate uh, Professor at World Languages and Cultures here at the University of Sam Houston State University. And it's a, my pleasure and honor to welcome author and, and Professor Terry Castaneda, who is gonna talk today about her recent work, Mary Mason Potts, The Letter, Letter Life of a Californian, California Indian Activist. Um, this event, is possible thanks to the College of Humanities and Social Sciences Committee of Diversity and Inclusion. I would like to thank all the members and co-chairs, and in particular, the finance coordinator, Brittany Johnson, who always does uh, with all of us extraordinary work so that we have experiences in our campus and online that are always remembered and spectacular. Uh, Dr. April uh, Shermak is with us, and she's the co-chair co of the um, committee, and she will let us know a little bit more about the raffle for this event and mention some of the series of events that are coming up. Hi, everyone. Um, as Monse said, I am Dr. April Shermak, and I am the co-chair of the CHSS Diversity and, and Inc Inclusion committee and I'm an associate professor in the Department of English. I wanted to thank Dr. Castaneda for the presentation today. And this is part of a series of events that the committee is sponsoring this semester. Um, we have others, um, a number of other events, uh, another Indigenous event, uh, Indigenous author event, I don't know how you describe it. Um, there are events for Black History Month, uh, Women's History Month. So there are a number of events coming up. Just look for the announcements for those. Thank, thank you. you so much. Well, thank you all for coming, students, officers, colleagues, and general public. Please allow me to share the schedule for today so you know where we are at. We will first introduce the author and we'll give her some general questions so you get to know her better. And Dr. Castaneda will then talk about her book. So during all this time, I ask you to keep your mics off so that we don't have background noise to avoid any disturbances. And we'll ask you to share any comments any questions in the chat so that we can go back to them uh, in the Q&A uh, um, moments at the last uh, minutes of the um, event. So let me go back to our Facebook page and I'm gonna read Dr. Castaneda that videos. I always like to share what I read so that people may feel more comfortable reading with us. So here we have it. Um, Dr. Terry Castaneda is Professor of Anthropology at California State University, Sacramento, where she teaches courses in ethnographic analysis and museum anthropology, and also serves as faculty curator for the department's museum. She earned her doctorate at Rice University and her BA at Texas A&M. Prior to moving to California, she worked at the, at the Houston Museum of National Science and taught at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. So welcome. We have a few questions as students and I thought of questions we would like to ask you. So I will start with one question and, and hopefully my students will follow up. If not, I'll continue. We have three questions for you. The first one is, why did you decide to write this book? Well, I, had, I asked myself that question many times during the process of trying to meet my deadline. <laughs> because it's a huge mammoth um, undertaking. And I was on a sabbatical. I teach at a teaching intensive university. 
city. So um, there, were, there were times where I questioned my, my uh, sanity in, in, in writing the book. But I have to say that the primary reason is because she's just such an outstanding figure who was known in Sacramento, especially in the later years of her life. Um, the last three decades, she, toward the last 15 years, became somewhat of a local celebrity, in part because she was active at the state capitol, and she was a writer, and she published a newspaper out of her home. But um, I think the more important thing has to do with the fact that her story is a 20th century California native story, uh, the story of someone who experienced forced assimilation in boarding schools, uh, survived it, adapted to it, and then used those tools of assimilation to, to write back and to um, help California Native people pursue land claims and, and to gain, uh, regain things that had been stripped from them uh, in the process of, of that period of the early, uh, well, the late 19th and early 20th century. And, and then her later years are just a remarkable story of someone who with very few resources, really no financial means, operates this, this California Indian newspaper out of her home uh, on a mimeograph machine, no less. So I think she's just a remarkable, intelligent, adventurous um, woman. And we don't have enough stories of California Native women, although California Native women are starting to write them. So I have some at the, at the very last slide, I post some stories and books written by a new generation of Native scholars, which is really exciting here in California. Wonderful. This is wonderful to hear. So we have a two more questions. Any, any student would like to ask a question? May I ask her a question, Dr. Foy? Please, Danny. Okay, um, what were your biggest um, influences while you were writing the book? Um, the native students in my classes, I would say. Um, I had a lot of native California students um, that I, I was fortunate to become um, uh, engaged in a kind of reciprocal teaching and learning process. They taught me about their culture and then I um, helped them and this was in undergraduate would in graduate context to gain a, a sense of, of their own authority and, and capability of, of becoming a scholar. And so I would have to say that was one of my influences. Um, and they, these students have gone on to get doctorates and, and become um, professors in their own right or else they're on the, the path to that. Um, other influences, well, there, there was a, um, I guess as a child, I, I, I read a lot of biographies. I was, I grew up in a fairly traditional household where I didn't see a woman working outside the home. So I think I was constantly looking for alternatives. And I think it's really, really, really important that people have mentors and role models. And that's true for women, especially, you know, across a whole range of, of possibilities for how to live a life. So. I think the early reading that I did as a kid as a way to kind of learn about options was really important. It is, it is. Oh, this is wonderful models for us and for our students. Our students have a couple more questions, I believe. And don't feel shy, look at me. I'm always nervous, but I do it no matter what. So you do the same. <laughs> Who has a question? So I do have a question. Uh, what is the most important idea you hope uh, readers will take away from your book? That California Native people are resilient, that they survived the genocide uh, that was perpetrated upon them and that continues through policy to be perpetrated through um, pollution of the land, inability to practice their, their traditions in, in, in school settings, public school settings often. The late eight, 19th century has been uh, in California has been, been written about quite a bit. And these were dark days of uh, militia and, and so forth. And it's important that white people hear those stories. But native people know a different story and um, they know that they survived and they know that they thrived 
during really tough times. And so I think perseverance and resilience is, and, and understanding that those native people are sitting in, in classrooms next to them, they're working in museums, they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> they are part of the community in California and beyond. So I think that that story of, of resilience and perseverance, especially native women who have always carried the, the load, so to speak. And I love in your book title that um, the, uh, the word lettered there, because we always tend to think that these stories have uh, um, stories of victimhood, but not so much stories of people who were very um, learned and intellectual and leaders for their communities and for other communities as well. So I love that word in the title. I really like it. Do we have any other questions? Yes, Lily. Oh, you muted, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, please, I would like to know, based on your book, what advice do you have for us, like in our little corners um, to um, fight, not fight, um, yes, what can we do like as individuals to combat discrimination and prejudice like as individuals? Um, uh, that's a we, yes, like in our little corners, what can we do? What advice do you have in our classrooms, in our friends? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I actually have a land acknowledgement in my syllabus. I, I would urge you to, you know, our nation was built on stolen land and enslaved labor. And I think one of the things that um, your generation is beginning to do <laughs> is to speak that out loud to authority, to power. And I, 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 I know this is a process in different parts of the country and among different populations of people, but we're in universities. And universities are where are, are, are the formal location of knowledge production and of pushing pushing us forward into new understanding. So I, I think it's, I think the work falls upon people like me, <laughs> descendants of settlers, white people. Um, students should not have to um, extend themselves to the extent that they do to get people to listen and to understand. So I think organizations like the one you're in now and um, publications. I mean, one of the things that made the land claims in California so um, vital and was so understood by other California native people is because they decided to take the business of publishing and editing into their own hands. And we have lots of models for that <laughs> over the years, but I, I say start websites, um, speak back. I, I think this is, both the wonders and the dangers of Twitter at the very same time, right? But there are other forms too. So I just, I, one of the reasons that I like teaching and, and I, I will eventually retire, it won't be too long, but is that I get to be around young people and that's where, that's where the future rests. And so I, I say exercise your voice, but also exercise your writing um, and, and having, um, uh, an ombuds person you can go to in your university to push, to push for um, change in syllabi, change in curricula, <laughs> change in um, how under resourced, underserved, underrepresented people um, are met. How that mission is met by universities is is really important. And I don't think we're going to see a, a sea change of the sort that we need until universities begin to hire professors who represent the student populations. And I, I know that's a challenge in my university as well, but we have to, we have to hire them, we have to tenure them, and then we, and the change will follow from there. And, and I think it'll change across the landscape too. So many, <laughs> so many truths, so well said, so fast. Oh, I love it. So I love how she just 
talk about everything that we need to do. There is a lot to do, but today the, we're doing it already. I, I feel so bad. I left your book on the couch downstairs because I was reading it last night. So, but I'm going to pick it up right, real quick. So we are doing it right now. We are reading her book. We are sharing this event. One of the silver linings of, of, of being at home is that we can invite the general public to the university so they can also learn with us. And now it's time to stop sharing our social media so that Dr. Castaneda can take the stage and let us know about her book. There will be a few minutes before the, uh, the event finishes for more questions. If you have anything that comes to mind, just put it on the chat and we'll go to it later. Dr. Castaneda. All right, let's see if I can get my screen to share and sharing. There we go. So, excuse me, of course I lose my voice the second I share my screen. Um, well, first of all, I wanna start off uh, with a land acknowledgement. I'm coming to you from Carmichael, California. My university is in Sacramento, just six miles away. And both my home and my university are located on the ancestral territory of the Nisenan people. Unseated, I might add. I also want to thank you guys, the, the students and the faculty and staff of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Sam Houston State University for inviting me to speak. And um, I guess uh, the only other thing to say is that the book was published in uh, November last year by the University of Oklahoma Press and I'm really pleased to be here. I wanted to start out with a map that sort of orients you to Marie's early years, but also to the legacy of the Native American boarding school experience, the intergenerational trauma that's still suffered by descendants of boarding school students. Marie was an alumna of two uh, Native American off-reservation boarding schools one in uh, Greenville, California, very close to her homelands. I have another map that I'll show you in a moment that'll situate that a little more clearly. But she went out at 17 years old, out here to Pennsylvania to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, where she honed her writing skills and her leadership skills. And uh, in some senses, those those skills that she took home, her, her diploma and her, um, the exuberance that she felt in being around all these other young people from other native nations. The school had changed a bit by this time, by the way. Um, she wasn't able to use that in the way she, she initially anticipated, but in her later years, it just comes rushing back and she takes up the pen and um, the podium and she becomes an important social activist. So while she's a California native person, she actually shares experiences across the entire uh, US. And you'll notice there's no off-reservation boarding school here in Texas. This is Chiloco. This is um, uh, Chamawa up in um, Oregon. Um, I wanna point out where this Carson Indian School is in Nevada because her girls went there and to uh, Sherman Institute, which in its, in the um, 19, uh, 50s and 60s was also drawing students from the American Southwest. So one of the questions that um, Dr. Fayol asked me was about one of the most uh, surprising things I discovered when I was researching the book. And I have to say that there were many, um, including the fact that her ancestors had sued the federal government to try and remain on their land. I'm sorry, not the federal government, the, the um, state of California, they took their case to the Supreme Court to try and remain on their land. But um, I think the most exciting discovery that I made was sitting in my own library, reading microfilm, the uh, newspaper of the Women's National Indian Association and finding Marie's voice at barely five years old, uh, reproduced in a letter written by one of the school teachers to the national office where 
where um, Amelia Quentin and uh, later other editors were, were publishing information and stories um, and propaganda about the, the important work they were doing, Christianizing and Americanizing Native students in uh, across the country. And so what I was most surprised to see was that here she is and she's barely learned English and she's asking her teacher, Mrs. Truebody, for a needle so she can sew a doll. And this was how she approached everything. She was just, when she wanted something, she went after it. If, if she wasn't adept at it, she mastered it. She continued to sew for her entire life. She ran classes for young native women out of her home in Sacramento, teaching them how to make quilts, how to make clothing and so forth. But that was the most um, surprising uh, sort of um, voice to emerge. I never thought I would recover anything of her during her period at the Greenville Indian School. So this orients you to the places that she lived. This uh, is this larger map is a blow up of this section of um, Northern California. And here is Sacramento, where she spent the last three decades of her life. The Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area is here. This is Lake Tahoe. If you've uh, been out to California, that'll help orient you a bit. But this is very mountainous country where she was born, 4,500 um, feet up, you know, high altitude, uh, mountainous, and she was, she was born in what was called Big Meadow, later flooded to form a reservoir, you know, a, a hydroelectric reservoir. But she was born along in here and um, she lived with her grandparents. The, the displacement of, of, of mountain Maidu people from their homelands was, um, was gradual, but by the time Marie was born in 1895, there was a tradition of native ranching the area was invaded certainly for the gold rush in 1849, but, it, but um, more in the lower reaches of the Feather River. But by the, by the 1860s and 70s, overland immigrants and people from around the world literally had come for the gold rush, but ended up going into this region, which, which was a, a beautiful lush meadow to began a dairy ranching tradition. So part of Marie's story is very intercultural because her, her uh, mother's sister was married to a Swiss Italian immigrant and um, his children were uh, cousins who uh, Marie was like siblings with. And so she grew up in a very intercultural environment, but being pushed to the margins meant that native people were working for these ranchers. They had previously managed their own lives. They were autonomous and, um, and made a living through hunting and fishing and so forth. But, but at this point, they were pushed off of their land, but not wholly off their land. Ranchers wanted to keep them around, the dairy farmers, because they needed the labor. So, so that's a whole nother sort of sad story, um, but they adapted. I think that's the thing. So she was living with her grandfather here when she was, when she was uh, taken to boarding school at the Greenville Indian Industrial School. So this is about 20 miles as the crow flies northeast of, of her homelands. <clears throat> and these are other locations that she lived in later in her life when she returned from, California, from Pennsylvania and the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. She worked mostly up in Chester. She and her husband ran a, a resort along here, a hunting and fishing resort It's at a, uh, one point in time. Here's Mount Lassen. I'll show you a photograph of it later. Um, she started married life in, in this copper mining community called Ingle Mine. But continuing with the Greenville story, I thought I would read quickly a passage of her arrival at this school. And I've of course rewritten it, but she told it many times. It was an important story um, in, in her years of talking to school children. So the, this is a picture in the upper right hand corner of the Greenville Indian Industrial School in about 1910. It was not quite that um, built out, but you can see it's, it's wood, it's, um, it's a rural environment and the uh, 
The school that Marie arrived to had been started by the Women's National Indian Association. At that point, it was called the, the Mission Indian School. And it began as a day school. And then in 1894, it transitioned to a boarding school under still the authority of the Women's National Indian Association. But by the time Marie arrived, so just um, months to a year prior, the federal government had begun to take it over. And so the Commissioner of Indian Affairs was having a greater say in the, in the lives of, of students who were drawn mostly at that point from the local community. But it was a boarding school by this point. So I'm reading from page 33 the subheading arrival, escape, and rescue in, in scare quotes. Marie's carefree life with Huckus Bem and Mariah, those are her grandparents, wound to an abrupt close in June 1900. In February, the Office of Indian Affairs student recruitment and transportation. The government wanted its beds filled. The Amants, this is the superintendent and his wife, Floyd, often found the commissioner's expectations tedious and absurd, but they were dedicated to the school's Christian mission and on occasion, these aligned with his demands. For a decade, Floyd had ministered to the sick, checked on elderly Maidu and distributed medicine, clothing and toys sent by the barrel full from WNIA affiliates. The Women's National Indian Association had branches all over the country. Floyd was a familiar presence in Big Meadow, where between late spring and early summer, she made three trips to visit camps and collect students. Recent acquisition of a covered wagon made these excursions decidedly more comfortable and efficient. Perhaps Marie was more curious than scared on the road to Greenville, but this quickly changed. Boarding pupils were bathed upon entry and in some schools subjected to haircuts and destruction of tribal clothing. She was not going to escape this ritual. Marie surveyed her strange surroundings while Floy stripped her down. Spotting a tub of steamy water, she was terrified to find herself suddenly inhabiting it. Unable to speak or understand English, she drew on experience. Knowing that Mariah used big tubs to cook acorn mush, Marie ascertained that she had been plucked of her clothes for the very same purpose. Bolting out of the tub and door, she sprinted naked and frightened into the countryside as far as her little legs would carry her. Two miles or more, she later recalled. Woefully, her escape was thwarted when an older pupil caught up to her on a bicycle. For the next 12 years, minus a few summer weeks here and there and two years in public school, Greenville Indian Industrial School was home. Not because she boarded there for so long that she forgot her grandparents' camp or her mother's existence, but rather because it became an important site of family practice and belonging. The pupil who came after her was her 14-year-old cousin, Eli Piazzoni, the eldest Greenville pupil in the Bill lineage. Her grandfather, by the way, was known as Big Meadow Bill by Americans. And Piazzoni is the last name of her aunt's husband from um, the Canton Ticino in uh, Switzerland. Eli, the eldest, uh, so the pupil who came after her was her 14 year old cousin, Eli Piazzoni, the eldest Greenville pupil in the Bill lineage. Marie was the youngest. In fact, at age four, she was the youngest student in the entire school. In between fell multiple siblings and cousins. Half siblings, John and Lizette Mason were eight and six. John Piazzoni was 12 and Amy was 10. Rose was six and Alice was five. The youngest Piazzoni, Pauline, was an infant of not quite one. Older cousins had come and gone. Eli's rescue of Marie was simultaneously an act of betrayal and an expression of love, a poignant testament to the condition of being colonized as a people and determined to exercise the protective ties of family and kinship that boarding schools sought to undermine. Bundling up his naked little cousin in his shirt, he pedaled back to Floy in the waiting bath assuring his little, assuring Marie in their shared Maidu language that she was not going to be cooked alive. So returning to this uh, slide, you can see here Marie Mason in the Greenville Indian School um, enumeration in the census of 1900. So she was born in 1895. She um, was taken to Greenville at about four and a half years old. 
And by the time she's asking for that needle so she can sew a doll and join her cousins in sewing classes, her older co Piazzoni cousins, she's um, been there long enough to pick up a little bit of English, but she didn't actually enter classes until the next year which is kind of interesting because there were, of course, uh, regulations that students as young as Marie were not supposed to be at the school. But her cousins actually wanted her there. And that's not hard to understand, right? You want to be with your family wherever you happen to be. So I posted a photograph of Marie in, in the in a, a, a Greenville boarding school students in the Facebook uh, post. And in that image, she is on the back row on the far left, and she's very close to the period of time in which she's going to go out to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. But here we find her on the uh, lower left, this broad smile that graced her face for all of her life. She was a happy person for the most part. And um, she's a, probably about um, seven or eight years old here. The years in which she attended Greenville are from June 189, uh, that's actually incorrect, 1910, 19, excuse me, 1900 to October 1912. And this is one of her Piazzoni cousins. Uh, this is the, the young girl, um, Ellen Reeves, who would marry um, her husband's brother. So there are a number of, um, of relatives that I can pick out in this photograph. So in, in 1912, she is drawn out to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. And this is a postcard. You can see how different this campus is, <coughs> excuse me, from her rural, mountainous, very small campus in um, Greenville. And the Carlisle Indian Industrial School had been around for quite some time. And in its early years, it had a, a pretty, um, ugly, ugly history. Um, besides the deaths and the, the taking of children from their families, there were, um, there was severe corporal punishment. There were much younger children at the school and so forth. By, but by the time Marie went, it was a slightly different institution. And I spent many years trying to figure out why Marie would go to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School because the narrative that we have of American Indian boarding schools is that everything that happened in them was forced. And, and, um, and yet Marie throughout her entire life looked back on this experience with tremendous nostalgia. And, and we also have a lot of writings about how that works in terms of trauma and so forth. But I eventually found records that showed that she was not only following her cousin, her Piazzoni cousins out to Carlisle, but also influenced by one of the, the graduates of Carlisle uh, named Selena Tuguns, a Seneca woman who um, in, her, in her early 20s got a job working at the Greenville Indian School as a, um, what was called a small boys matron and that meant the young boys uh, matron. She was the one who took care of the young boys a replacement, so to speak, for their mothers. That tells you something about the nature of these schools, right? So at any rate, she was a graduate, Selena Tugan, a graduate of this school, and she was writing the superintendent of the school, telling him she wanted to recruit Marie, that Marie was exactly the kind of really bright, ambitious young woman who should go there. So there were these two twin forces that, that drew her out there. But as she moves on in life, it becomes very clear that she was she was an adventurous sort of person. She loved to travel and she probably wanted to experience the sorts of settings that her cousins were writing home about and to be with her cousin Eli, who for all of her life was sort of like a brother and a mentor. And Eli is the uh, cousin who had come after her when she tried to uh, run away from the school. So Marie was there from from the uh, middle of September 1912 to uh, June of 1915. And when she matriculated at Carlisle, she did not place in the grade level she expected to. The Greenville Indian Industrial School had formal uh, class classes through seventh grade, but the superintendent uh, schooled Marie and another student 
in, independently in the eighth grade curriculum. And Murray took care of some of the younger uh, students, including a, 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 a Maidu man who would later become well known as a, a painter named Frank Day. So she sort of worked to, to um, to stay at the school and to get this eighth grade education, but she didn't place into the ninth grade when she took her placement exams at Carlisle. So she spent the first year there, uh, uh, a grade level lower than she expected to be. And if she had stayed on that track, it would have been four full years, but she was a very smart, like all the other students who were there, they learned the system very well. And they used the outing system to to gain experiences that they might not have had access to otherwise. The outing system was a formal system invented by Richard um, Henry Pratt, which took students and placed them in homes, in, in white uh, Christian homes, so that they would further um, assimilate to this Christian patriarchal nuclear family tradition. So Marie went to school on campus from for her first year, 1912 to 13, but then she went on outing during the summer of 1913 with a family um, named the Raps. And they, they lived in a suburb of Philadelphia, but they had a summer house um, in Ocean City, New Jersey. And that was Marie's first glimpse of an ocean. So here she is literally hours from the San Francisco Bay or the coastline, but the first time she saw an ocean was in uh, Ocean City, New Jersey, and she loved it. And then she used the next school year, she learned from other uh, students that there was a public school in Morristown, New Jersey, uh, where she could advance in grade levels by taking exams rather than sitting through schoolwork and so forth. And so she went on outing with a, uh, at the home of a Quaker woman named Rebecca Love. And there she um, took care of all these duties for this elderly lady and uh, who, who died not long after Marie gra graduated. But she was in the public school system and she managed to get through two grade levels. And so she returned her last year at Carlisle 1914 to 15 on par with the, um, the grade level she expected to be at. Now this, this photograph is from an earlier time than Marie was there and the little snippet is from a later time. It's, it's uh, discussing and reporting and I think this was 19, 1916, uh, I could be wrong, that Susan Longstreth has donated some archives to Carlisle. Marie was a member of the Susans, a literary society. And it's, I put this slide up here just to remind me to tell you that this was a place where she really flourished. They opened a lot of meetings at Carlisle by requiring students to quote from a poem or some author. And um, in fact, their roll call, that was that way. So imagine being in a classroom today and, and someone taking attendance. And when you're called on, you have to recite a quotation. That was the world in which Marie um, was operating in her last year at Carlisle. Checking my time here. So there is some writing that gets published in, well, actually a lot of what I learned about Marie during her time at Carlisle was taken from the student newspaper. And there's a surprising amount of, of her presence there. But in the senior year, the, of uh, Marie's year at least, there was a edition of the Carlisle Arrow. And as you can see here, it was printed by students, by Indians. And it went out, of course, across the countryside. It was kind of part of this propagandistic machine. But students also got a chance to show off a little bit of the skills and, and their own um, hopes, right, for their future. So here's a passage that she's written some verse uh, about th that really resonates with her later years as an activist and also is oriented to the values of the Mountain Maidu world, which was grounded in reciprocity. So it was called, what have I to give? What have I to give to the world? I can give to the world the best that I have and know I can be kind and generous where generosity is needed. I can help others where I'm capable of helping. What have I to give my people? I can give many things to my people. When I go back to my people, I can teach them what I have learned, tell them of the world that I have seen, heard and known. What have I to give myself? If I am good and kind to others, they will be the same to me. If I help them, they will in turn want to help me. If I have given to them the best I had, they will want to give uh, me of the best they have. If I have taught them anything, they will want to teach me of what they know. 
Silver and gold have I none, she quotes, but such as I have, I give unto thee. What have I to give the world? Give to the world the best that you have and the best will come back to you. And Marie lived her entire life really on a shoestring, but she was an incredibly generous person. And she did a lot of traveling. And in that same edition of the senior uh, newspaper, there's a, uh, an, a long essay, which I only quote a portion of in the textbook, but it's about a trip to Philadelphia, ostensibly to see the, um, the, evan the baseball player turned evangelist Billy Sunday preach. And this was under the auspices of her white WCA group. And she was the president of it that year. But the entire essay is sort of like a travelogue, an exuberant expression of how much she loved the city of Philadelphia and how much she liked going places and experiencing new things, whether it was going to the top of Wanamaker department store and surveying the entire uh, cityscape of Philadelphia or going to, they went to the Betsy Ross house and to mu the museums at um, around the city, especially to the University of Pennsylvania. And they looked at, of course, the Native American collections there. And one of the things that uh, foreshadows her future is, of course, there's, there's nothing there from her people. They did not figure into this um, exhibit of Native American traditions. So she graduates in 1915 and um, she goes back in 1953. She's on a, um, a delegate trip to Washington DC. She's testifying at the legislature and on the way back with her good friend, Bertha Stewart, another native California woman, Tolowa woman, they stop into the Army War College, which the campus of Carlisle has reverted to this barracks. And there's this kind of ragtag museum and inside of it, she finds a class pennant. This was their, their motto, fidelity. Kind of interesting that she, you know, she read into that, that she was meant to return uh, to see it. After she graduates, she goes home. This is an image of Mount Lassen. And um, she, ma she marries an old schoolmate from Greenville. She has five children. She labors as a domestic around the uh, margins of her former homeland. She runs a fishing and hunting camp with her husband and she suffers some domestic abuse. Her children, you know, it's the depression happens during this time and her, her children are really the center of her life. She, she puts so much effort into making sure that they have an education that allows them to pursue a different life than being a domestic servant in hotels and, and white homes. And in 1942, she moves to Sacramento and um, she becomes involved with this organization called the Federated Indians of California. And I sent forward some information to um, the class about this organization, but it really launched her career. And you can see here the masthead of this uh, newspaper that by which she became very well known. It was actually started by her daughter in 1948. Uh, Marie took it over and Marie was probably running it from the, the very beginning. They were all living in the same household. There's an interesting figure in, in the newspaper that she, the voice of which she claims she um, takes on this gendered, male gendered uh, identity at times. But Injun Louie is a caricature of the racist perceptions that white people had of them and their inability to take care of their own affairs. And part of what they're doing is they're, they're um, they're using the newspaper in its very early days to say, hey, we're the only all California Indian land claims organization. If you're in the FIC, the Federated Indians, then you'll get the truth about how our land claims are progressing in the Indian Claims Commission. But she also gets a huge following. She mails the newspaper to servicemen abroad. Um, She's a pretty humble editorial presence in the early days. This is rare for her to actually sign her initials here, but she um, eventually becomes a little more um, authoritative and, and owns her, her cultural knowledge and editorial role, but this is a, obviously a prayer. She's really getting a following here. She talks about how someone has written Injun Louie at the renewal ad address her home and saying, here's a dollar to keep the smoke signal coming my way. Great little paper. I so I get so I look forward to its arrival. I go out on my front porch and gaze Sacramento way to see if the smoke is rolling up. And there's a lot of humor in it as well. As the years roll on, she uses it to 
talk about traditional stories and practices and language to begin this project of cultural revitalization. At the same time, she's got a lot of political action going on because she's in the state capital. So there's a mix of all kinds of things, but basically she's creating with this newspaper, a California Indian diaspora. She's identifying shared food ways, shared traditions across an otherwise very diverse population, indigenous population in the state of California. Um, so in, the in 1961, she's invited to join the steering committee of the American Indian Chicago Conference, which took place in, um, at the University of Chicago. Here she um, represents the state of California, but also gets to know a friend. This woman had already been a friend, but um, Helen Peterson, who is the executive director of the National Congress of America. American Indians. And Helen invites her to, to do some a sojourn in Washington at the NCAI headquarters. She edits uh, as a guest editor the, 19, the May 1961 uh, NCAI bulletin. And this essentially brings this whole new audience to her doorstep. And she definitely begins more of a critique of white society, her her um, her her historical sense of herself is is pretty uh, formed by this time of her own boarding school experience. Here she's critiquing the fact that the boarding schools stripped Native people of their weaving traditions in California, and she talks about how now everything is closed off. It's a national park. It's a ranch. They can't even get to the weaving material, and often when they do, it's covered with pesticides, so it's dangerous for them to handle and use. And here she is doing uh, cultural demonstrations with a, a crook woman named um, Florence Harry. This is Marie's daughter, Pansy. And then finally, in uh, the late 1960s, actually around the time of the occupation of Alcatraz, just after it's begun in 1969. This man, Charles Trimble, oops, was my last slide, hang on. Charles Trimble forms the American Indian Press Association. Marie is like the pioneer of the American Indian Press. She's been doing it without a formal education, but she joins with all of these formally trained native journalists to create this um, American Indian Press Association. They create an award in her honor. And when she dies in 1978, her obituary goes out across uh, North, North America, Canada, down to Mexico. And it ran, this is a shorter, briefer version. There was a longer one, but it ran under the headline, Writer Dies. And I think that's a wonderful expression of how adaptive she was, how much resilience she, she um, exercised given that her society was grounded in oral tradition much of their land was stripped from them based on not only the difference in their own language but not being able to read english documents english language documents and then finally i wanted to show you her own book which she published in 1977 a very thin slim book that's meant for the for the lay public for children especially but I also have up here some of my favorite native authors, uh, California native authors, and there are many of them. So if any of you are interested in actually um, learning more about California native writers and scholars, please let me know because I do know quite a few. And I have I stopped sharing. Yes, you did. Okay, good. <laughs> I know I raced through that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, sometimes it's hard to figure out. It happens to me when I teach too. Yeah. So thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful presentation and reading. We learned so much. I really loved how you focus a lot on their formative, on her formative years and pay tribute to the storytelling and the community roots and not so much on, on productivity on, on, you know, so I really like how you incorporated not only her lettered uh, life, but also the community that raised her. Uh, and I, I love to hear, I went downstairs to pick up the book because I felt really bad. <laughs> so please, uh, everybody feel free now to share your comments, your questions. Remember that we have the Facebook page. If you don't have time today to, comment 
or work on it. So I know some of our students have been discussing how annexation of California was different from native and indigenous people that were assimilated in the Hispanic communities. Now we have heard other types of assimilation. So maybe you want to continue that discussion on the Facebook page as you write your small contributions this week. And it's a good way to learn from authors directly to people around the world, hopefully that would like to comment with us on Facebook. So feel free, no question is never a bad question. We all need to learn from each other. So I give you the, um, the voice, uh, unmute yourself or raise your hand and ask the question to the author. I know some co-hosts co are checking on the questions on the chat, so um, feel, feel free to go ahead. I wanted to say really quickly that I know you guys have been studying the Hispanic literature that came out of the, the mission in the uh, California period and so forth. The interesting thing about where Marie was, was born is that um, the Sonoma mission was the farthest north mission. So the, the Spanish traditions didn't really penetrate into that area. Um, but of course, American invasion and uh, the gold rush broadened into traditional life. And an early native newspaper editor, John Rowland Ridge, a Cherokee man, was editing the Sacramento, was, was publishing in the Sacramento Bee and the San Francisco, I can't remember if it's Herald or Chronicle. And, um, Who's the author of Joaquin Murieta that we have been discussing in our class, one of the earlier bandidos that were helping their communities during the gold rush and that's so true terry uh the hispanic missions and cities were on the coast so yep. yes very important to really situate very important so i'm thanking all of you back i see the thank yous in the chat and um i thank you all for for having me and it's it's um it's great to talk i love to talk to students and faculty so this feels right at home this is the calmest moment i've had since the semester started yesterday <laughs> I kind of can see students trying to add and drop courses over here, mostly add, but it's a crazy system under the, under COVID. Sorry, <laughs> this is a bad time. Dr. Phil Lopez. So someone has a question. Rodrigo has a question. Okay, so the question I wanted to ask was, uh, what, what, uh, what made Marie such a, like interesting topic for you to write about like what made her what made her such a um, like kind of um, like such a focal point for you to, to 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 write about she was a woman i think i have to say that she was a woman born in the 19th century right and she just she stands out from so many of her peers because she was such an intellectual and so adventurous and so outgoing and i think I think one of the things that we fail to recognize is that there are intelligent, ambitious, adventurous people in every society, no matter how, how large or small or, re or remote or whatever their society is experiencing, there are, there are organic theorists and in intellectuals in those societies. And I think uh, while her book that she wrote, and she, she actually had a very humble persona in her interactions with people, she was super pragmatic. If she had to do some compromising to get something done, she would take the long view and do it some of the time. Um, she also had a very sharp tongue, so she could <laughs> she could she could speak back when necessary. But I think the the thing that her her book did, and she's she died in 1978, was it it gave just this very slim look at her experience. But people in Sacramento had many of them did not have any idea about this boarding school experience that she had. And so for me, being able to connect her activist years with becoming literate, forced to become literate, forced to take up the pen, um, but then she used it as a weapon. And I think that's what I like the most about it. And, and the fact that she just did what she wanted to do, whether she had the funding to do it or not. And she did not have, she was not a woman of means at all. So she was an inspiring figure and we don't have enough 
stories about the amazing California Native women in um, indigenous to this, you know, now state of California to to really see this other side. We have a lot of stories of genocide. We have a lot of stories of the gold rush and so forth. So her story's grounded in the gold rush with her grandfather and grandmother and so forth and the really cosmopolitan <laughs> community that rushed in from all across the globe from South America and France and Italy and all over and uh, formed this intercultural world and it was full of violence and intimacy and all kinds of things. Marie was a product of rape. So there's just a long span that her life covers, a lot of, of, of stories that people can relate to, but we don't see them um, embodied in a single life the way we do with Marie. So I was kind of hoping to do that, hoping to kind of put that lived experience into a, a narrative form that helps people understand the experiences of native California people in Northern California, especially. Thank you for that question, Rodrigo. Thank you. Karen is one of our um, organization officers and leaders of the community here at Sam Houston, and she has volunteered to um, help with the chat. But anyone can, you know, uh, jump in if they need to. Um, Karen, I think you muted. Wait. Yes. Are you muted, Karen? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Is there anything you want to say? Or? Yes, I, like I'm back. No, 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 I'm back. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, so um, as Dr. Fee, um, can, I can finally introduce myself, right? Sure. Okay, <laughs> so um, as Dr. Fee Lopez said, um, my name is Karen Villegas, and I'm the communications officer for the Latinx Club uh, here at St. Houston State. Um, and basically just um, managing all social media content and um, just keeping everyone updated of everything that's going on um, within the university. And um, basically what we do in the Latinx club is just uh, promoting diversity within the Latinx uh, and Hispanic uh, community. Um, and then we have a series of events um, just to see, um, or just to um, get the hang of like, um, like diversity being being included right um very inclusive um like this semester i know it's because due to the, due to the pandemic uh we have um we had uh, to make big changes um as far as for events we haven't anything planned out yet but uh hopefully we will get to plan uh, those events soon and and I know some of you guys who are um, who are attending SAM um, might be able to join us and get to know a little bit more about our organization. Um, thank you, Karen. So, yeah. Thank you so much. We can continue on the Facebook so students can obviously connect all these experiences of indigenous people in all different communities. We have many questions, some from students, some from colleagues. Um, Shall I read some of them or colleagues want to say, I have a couple of colleagues here, Dr. Anglese, I hope I said it right, and Dr. Barca that grew around similar areas and had similar experience about never hearing about, you know, um, models and stories of, of how native and indigenous people um, produced knowledge and, and, and survived in assimilation and, and while we know that the gold rush was very, very uh, hard time for many communities, there was a lot of violence around it. So they have, they really enjoyed it all because of that. As you were saying just now, Dr. Castaneda, that we don't get to know about these stories much. So that's why this is very important, okay? I'm enjoying it. I read it last night. It's, it's, it's well researched as you also, but it's very well written. So it's, this is a movie, isn't it? This reads like a movie. It does read like a movie. Okay. Was, this is wonderful. a movie, a documentary at least. <laughs> you guys are wonderful for having me and letting me go on and, uh, about it. I've enjoyed reading in the chat, the students who either grew up out here or had parents grow up out here and who are verifying that yes, they there are a lot of stories that not, they did not hear. I mean, this is why we, we need um, a generation of students who's gonna go into the schools both K-12 and high school uh, and college and change the curriculum. 
diversify the curriculum. You know, the white canon is just like so exhausting. And when when I read the same old stuff over and over again, it's it's kind of like, well, this is not really the full story. It's not even the dominant story, the dominant truth. So I think we have to we have to get there. And also, not only the curriculums, like a lot of our students are going to law enforcement, they are going to uh, health facilities, and it's important to have heard these different stories, because sometimes these family stories, we think about the 19th century and we think, oh, well, whatever, the 19th century, right? But this, these traumas is, is carried on in the community. And as you say, periodicals, oral, oral storytelling, this is still very much alive. And it's important that they know who are they communicating with and how saying one thing to a person may not be the same as saying it to another person. And they will get much more um, professionally um, uh, powerful because they will be able to connect and engage in real ways. Right, that lived experience that that other people embody that we don't have. We all have our different experiences, right? Even if we're from the same society and so forth. So yeah, I think it's really important. We have another question from Mercedes. Mercedes, you wanna say it or? Oh, you muted Mercedes, sorry. Yes, uh, Dr. Castaneda, uh, so I was wondering if uh, during this process of assimilation of the boarding schools, um, Marie and the other students, were they able to maintain their native language? And also if I notice um, her writings are in English, um, was she able to, were they able to keep their language alive or that was lost? All right, so language loss is a, a very sad legacy of the boarding school tradition. Fortunately, Marie managed to keep her Maidu language and that's partly because she was in um, a boarding school very nearby her own community and her relatives and they, they were not supposed to speak Maidu at the Greenville Indian Industrial School, but they did. And, um, and interestingly, students um, oftentimes reported other students who were speaking their, their native tongue, <laughs> but there are also examples, um, even in the Women's National Indian Association news uh, paper where, where students were, were explaining to the superintendents why it was important to speak their own language. So Marie held on to hers and that made her different. However, the, the tradition of writing was, was, you know, they were an oral society. So there was not a sort of transliteration of Maidu into a written form during that period of time. So she learned English. And, um, and, and now there are um, certainly Mountain Maidu people writing in, writing their native tongue in, um, you know, in the literate form. But, but Marie was the first generation to, um, to write in, in the English language or any language, um, which was late uh, given, given the spread of uh, forced literacy in other parts of California. It was a rarity in uh, Northern California. So she not only held on to her language, but she was able to hold on to, to things that were expressed in her language that couldn't be expressed in English. Um, and there were, there were kind of covert sorts of uh, syncretic religious or ceremonial traditions that Maidu people practiced right under the nose of the, of the industrial school superintendents. And they assumed that these were games, but in fact, they were, um, they were uh, ceremonial practices that were sort of changing a bit over time. And, so I think, again, it's a, it's a story of indigenous people being much smarter um, and more subversive <laughs> than, than we give them credit for being in terms of managing to do what they need to do and want to do, living, living their own lives, while also participating in an economy that was forced upon them. And, and many of them becoming very good at that economy, becoming dairy farmers and so forth. Yes, yeah, so important the question about language and how language is intertwined with culture and how we have this hybrid um, um, 
you know, experiences and people who uh, are rich, different cultures and languages can very well, right, transition from one another and most of the times become ambassadors. So we have a final comment that I missed in the previous one. It's Zach Harris. I don't know if he's still here or he had to go. He almost here. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want me? Would, would you like to share? Um, would you like to share what you just mentioned? And, and Maria was also uh, commenting on it. So Zach, would you like to share with the author? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I had mentioned that my dad, um, when he was growing up very young in Utah, uh, had an Indian sister, but he wasn't quite sure um, exactly why, because he was he was that young that he he didn't really ask his parents and never really got him out of, got it out of him. But I guess that answers it. What Dr. Barker said, um, they were Mormon, so probably was that situation. But it was very interesting to hear about it, and I'm excited to tell him about it. Yeah. I have to say there was a lot of, um, if you if you want to understand a little bit more about Mormonism and, um, and the Navajo Nation in particular, uh, I have a colleague named Farina King, F-A-R-I-N-A, -A, and um, she teaches in Oklahoma. So I can give you her, her email address, but um, she's kind of delving. She, she herself is um, a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, but also Danae. So she's delving in, into the business of adoptions and, you know, transcultural adoptions and um, and the role that the um, Mormon church played in converting um, Native people. It's a pretty, pretty big story. Yeah. And complicated. I mean, all these stories are complicated. Marie's story is complicated. We can say, oh, this is the experience of boarding school student, but every student had a very different experience. That's so true. So we are almost done. I just want to give a chance to, we have our Dean, Dean Lee with us. And I don't know if is anything uh, you want to share with our students, with our colleagues, and with a general public that came today. Uh, I don't Want to put you in the spot? I just realized you were there, and I didn't invite you to to speak with us. So, if there's anything you like to let us know, please do. Well, um, not nothing particular. Just want to say thank you to all who organized this, and thank you um, for sharing this. It's a wonderful story. Um, not many people heard of it, including myself, and so really. Um, is how we diversify, not just um, class teaching, but also even the curriculum um, really is important to be truly inclusive. Thank you. I'm coming to the next one. <laughs> I've already registered. You are, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank awesome. You. Uh, our Dean is very supportive of this committee. So it's thanks to him also that we are uh, able to um, engage our students and everybody so that they think of other ways of seeing the same period of history, but from different voices or different literatures. So I think that's all for now. If I didn't pick a comment or a question, please feel free to to continue in Facebook. And if you start reading the book, let us know how you feel about it. And I thank you so much for coming. I thank Dr. Castaneda for, for being so willing to share her research and her experience with, our, with us. I think this is also a model for our students as they start being writers in my uh, class that writing and researching is a process and it's just enjoyable and it's a bit of a detective work. We have to find how things go together. So please read and enjoy knowledge. Uh, as you have seen the story of Marie tell us that some people had really had to fight to keep the knowledge that we can now enjoy. So enjoy it and, and share it. So I think that's all I have to say. If you have any questions, let me know and email me or post it on the Facebook. Thank you so much for coming. It was awesome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, anybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.